we had a great time getting away. Uh, went up to Colorado. We got snowed on. We got rained on. Uh, you name it, it happened. It, you know, it was, it was just incredible. And it was, it was so funny as we were driving. Is Amy in here? Good, I can tell this. As we're driving through the mountains of Colorado, we, we left Denver and we're going, you know, west and we're hitting, you know, we're getting up in the, the, I mean, way up there. Your ears are hurting, you know, you can't get, you're swallowing, chewing gum, trying everything. And then it starts snowing, blizzard snowing, not just like, oh, look at the pretty flakes. No, we're doing, the, you know, 75 down an interstate and massive flakes. I mean, huge flakes are coming down. My, my poor wife, she is so afraid of me and my driving. And she's like, pull over. We need snow chains. And, and I'm like, the road's just damp. It is not even sticking. You know, it's, it's okay. And, and she's like, we're going to die. She's crying. It was, she had a horrible time on that day. But it was so funny. I had to share that. So just, you know, she's not in here, so I could do that. But yeah, it was, it was so hilarious. And we go into the Eisenhower Tunnel, and, and that's the one that goes under the big mountain at the Continental Divide. And she's just freaking out. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. And we come out the other side, and it's beautiful. There's no bad weather. There's no snow. The sun's shining. We're like, what? It's like we teleported somewhere. But it was such a good time, such a good time, and, and uh, we really enjoyed it. And, and uh, I, you know, the, the thing about coming home is you have to come home. And uh, it's great to be back. It's great not to be, you know, it's great to sleep in your own bed and stuff like that. But, man, Colorado was beautiful. It was so beautiful. But, you know, it's always great to, to be home, but it's great to get away sometimes, too. Amen. And, uh, you know, there, there's been plenty of times where I've gone on vacations and I've done stuff and I've been to retreats. I had to go to Idaho for a funeral. And in those times when you, you get, a, my family didn't get to go with me. And it's, it's hard whenever you, you have to go somewhere and you can't take your family. And you know that, that feeling of leaving them home. And at first you're like, yes, freedom. I'm by myself. Finally. I can breathe, I can do whatever, and then, but then after a day or two, you start, like, you're calling home, like, every five minutes, like, what are y'all doing now? <laughs> so, have, have y'all ate lunch yet, you know? Uh, what else y'all going to do today? Oh, you're going to Hob? Oh, you're going to Lubbock. No time to talk to me. Oh, okay, you know. And, <laughs> fine, I understand. See ya. <laughs> Oh, I'm not missing you either. But you know that, 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 that moment when you come home and you get to see your family again. And, and I, I just love it. My kids will come running. Except for Luke. Luke don't really come running up. He's kind of like, yeah. yeah. Points at you. Here's one of those. You know, you got to go up to him and hug him because he ain't about to. You know, he's at that age. But, you know, the girls, they'll come running up and they hug you. And, oh, I missed you so much. But even the lead up to a vacation for Sophie is horrible. You know, not a vacation, but if I have to go somewhere, she's like, I'm going to miss you forever. I can't believe you're going to leave. You know, all this stuff's happening. And, and this is really going somewhere now. This is really going somewhere. I'm not just telling you all this sappy stuff for no reason. But that, you know, that, that moment when you get to see your loved ones again and you embrace and you're just so excited and you're so happy to see them. That's what it should be like when we come in the presence of God. That we're so excited to be in his presence. That we, it's just such an exciting reunion. A time, and there's time and a time when we're going to get to see him face to face. Amen. And he's coming back and we're going to get to go to him and be with him. He's going to call us up to him. And, and that reunion, that excitement of getting to see each other face to face for the first time again. To be able to, to be in His presence like never before. To feel His embrace around you. How exciting that will be. Amen. I remember when Amy went to Women of Faith and I was here with all the kids. And she came back and I was like, thank the Lord. You're home. 
and she came like it was at the end of a church service that they they all finally made it back and you know they had bad weather and they weren't able to get here in time for church and we didn't even have pianos or anything going that morning it was crazy but whenever she walked in the door and I'm preaching you know, well I wasn't preaching Matt was preaching at that time because I had a, a friend was down at that point but uh, and I see her I'm the, the first thing I'm thinking is thank the Lord. And I go running up to her. I'm, I'm a hugger. I'm so excited. I'm so happy to see my wife again. Because I love her. I love my wife. I love my family. I love my kids. I, I was happy to see some of you, but not like that. Okay? There's something special about that family connection. And there should be that special connection between us and God. I mean, what would you feel like if you've been gone for weeks or months and you come home and everybody's like, oh, you're back. Oh, so how'd it go? You know, and nobody's excited to see you and nobody's, you know, cares that you're even home. Sometimes I think that's the way we treat God. I think that's the way we treat Jesus, that we're not really that. Excited. I want you to come back, Jesus, someday. But. I'd like to go do this thing first or that thing first, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the free people who are single and not married. You're like, God, don't come back until after I'm married. Because I really want to experience married life. And then you get married. You're like, come quickly, Lord. <laughs> if you have, if you're married with children, you know, you have those days. But it, it's, it's just you, you, there's those times that, that I think more than not that we feel that we find that we're not so looking forward to his return. And I think it should be just the opposite for the people who love Jesus. That we should be so excited about what heaven's bringing to us. About the return of our king, of our savior. But we don't really think about it much. But today, we're going to think about it. We're going to see what it's going to be like when he comes. When he comes riding in on that horse. We're in Revelation 19. If you want to turn there or it will be on the screen. Revelation 19. And as you turn there, I'm just going to pray for us this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be here today. To teach us from your scripture. I pray that you prepare our hearts and our minds to receive from you today. God, let us hear the message that you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Revelation 19. We've seen in, at the end of 18, we've seen the, the fall of Babylon the Great. We've seen that the great, uh, the, the harlot... Of Babylon be consumed by the beast. We've seen the, the, this, this world system. This, this uh, the, the false religion that's come up. That it's just. It, the, the war has been waged. We've seen the fall of Babylon the great. We see all these things happening. And the, the, the enemy. Your enemy. Is about to be judged. It's coming to a close. Everything's, the, the, everything's being brought to an end here. And it's bringing excitement to heaven. And it's that excitement I want you to see as we start reading in, in chapter 19. The first verse, it says, After this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. For true and just are His judgments. He is condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And again they shouted, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who was seated on the throne. And they cried, Amen! Hallelujah! Then a voice came from the throne saying, praise our God, all you, all you, his servants, you who fear him, both great and small. Then I heard that what sounded like a great multitude, like a roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, hallelujah, for our Lord God almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory 
For the wedding of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given, given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Let's stop right there for a minute. We see this excitement in heaven and the excitement in heaven whenever the, you hear these hallelujahs. What does it say at first? He says, he hears a roar from the great multitude. Who is going to be in that number, in that great multitude? We are. They're going to be shouting hallelujah. You know what hallelujah means? Hallelujah is only in the New Testament in this chapter, in this book. It's the only place in the New Testament that you see this. It's not translated for you, but they have what's called the, the, the Hallel Psalms in the book of Psalms, where the Hallelujah Psalms is what they're called, that where you see these, the, this, this word where it's actually translated for us, this Hallelujah, this word is actually a two part word. Hallel is the first part of it. And Hallel means a, a praise that's given in, in regard to something. Whenever victory has come to the people here in Revelation, they, they, they cry out in victory. They, they, they worship their God. They, they, they get crazy for God. They give a Hallel praise. And then hallelujah. Hallel praise. You. And then the J-A-H. Which is also in the, in the Hebrew. It would be Y-A-H. It would be the, the, in, in the, the, the actual spelling of it. What do you think that means? Yahweh. Yahweh. The J is just transliterated. It's just, just part of it. It's just the, the you know, from the Greek. But it, it means praise the Lord. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. This is you know, God Himself. Praise God. But it isn't like praise God. Whew. So glad. No, this is a praise that stems from way down inside because of the excitement of what you're seeing. The thing that you're seeing take place. It's kind of crazy, isn't it? That, that we see this, this judgment that's coming and they're so excited. But if you understood who was being judged, we look at all these people and we think, all oh, those poor people that said they didn't want God and shook their fist at God and said they didn't need Him. And yet my heart breaks for people that refuse to turn to God. That refuse to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. My heart breaks for them. But at some point, personal responsibility has to kick in. And we will stand before our Maker. And there will be judgment that is pronounced. And you want to be on the right side of this. How can Jesus, how can a, a God who's so loving allow people to face this kind of end? Well, he didn't take it for you. He did. You choose where you go. You choose your eternity. It's up to you. I'm just glad that He showed us this ahead of time so that we would know the way to go. You ever had somebody give you directions and, and there's road construction? You know, you Just try telling somebody how to get to Lubbock right now. Using the Plains Highway. Well, don't use the Plains Highway because you're going to get hung up in traffic. You know, that they're working on it. Go down the Denver City Highway till you get to the state line, then cut across, and then you can go on up. You know, you, every, you, know, you got certain ways. But, you, you know, somebody gives you directions. It's up to you to follow them. It's up to you to listen. It's up to you if you want to go sit in line for 30 minutes. Or you can go the easy way. And this is Jesus showing us this is the directions. This is the way you go. This is the way you avoid this stuff. But at this point, it's over. Judgment is about to come. Jesus is about to return. And heaven is excited. We hear the roar of people praising God. Yet we come to church and we're like, 
Ah, whatever the words are. One time. Ah, oh, look, I got a shoe. Something on my shoe. God. And we're just so disconnected. This is our Savior we're talking about. Can we, can we do something? Just You're going to feel really stupid, but it's okay to feel stupid sometimes. But what I want you, I just want you to, to do something with me this morning. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. Now say it like you think they would say it. Hallelujah. Can you hear the, the difference? The, I know you, you probably felt a little silly. Some of you are like, I ain't saying that. <laughs> no way. People think I'm weird. <laughs> I think you're weird if you don't say it. But who cares if they think you're weird? We're not saying it for them. We're saying it for Him. Do you understand what He's done for you? Do you understand that that enemy that's been beating you down is defeated because of Him? Maybe if we could just see it. Maybe if we could see this thing happening, we'd get a little more excited. Well, guess what? They see it happening. And they're really excited. And the roar of hallelujah goes up. Hallelujah. Four times we hear it. Each time it's building and building. Till at the very end you hear this roar as the, the roar of mighty waters. We went to, to uh, Fish Creek Falls in Steamboat Springs. It was awesome. This awesome sight of this waterfall. Coming over the side of this mountain. And to see and it's beautiful. And you're just you're, I, I, we were just in awe. We just stood there looking at the power of this water. Amen. The country has experienced the power of water Amen. this past week. The flooding, the things being swept away, the force of nature. But as we stood there watching those falls, and you hear that roar. Of that water. As we, we stopped in the parking lot. You couldn't see the place. You had to walk for ways to get there. But as you step out of the parking lot. You start hearing this roar start to build. And you can hear it coming. You're like it's got to be. We, we got to be real close. And you're, you're walking for a ways. till you finally even get to where you can see a glimmer of it. But it's like that kind of a roar. It's building. And it's building. And then it says it was like peals of thunder. Now, in Scripture, when you see pills of thunder, who does that normally refer to? To God. To God speaking. When God spoke in the Old Testament, we have, it was thunder and lightning. And it was this awesome event. And it, it, it freaked people out. And so that's why in, in the Old Testament, they said, Moses, you just go talk to God. Because he's really, really loud. Where Moses heard a voice, they all heard thunder and lightning and all these things happening. And it freaked them out. And they said, we, 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 you, you go handle that. We can't handle that. You go talk to him by yourself. We, we don't want that. But here we see the people of God are worshiping God so loudly that it sounds like him. That it begins to sound the sound of thunder as they cried, Hallelujah! 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 As it would build and build because they're so excited for what's about to take place. There's a wedding, a feast that we're about to see. But we just kind of look at Jesus and yeah, God's coming back. Yeah, he's coming back one day. Why is it that the only people that look forward to God's to Jesus appearing are the people who got it bad? You ever notice that somebody gets cancer? Oh, Lord, come quickly. Somebody stumps their toe. Oh, Lord, come quickly. Like the two even compare, but 
You know, in the bad times, we're like, come quickly, Lord. And then whenever it's real good and finances are great, everything's going good. We just bought the new Lincoln or whatever you're driving, you know, uh, Honda minivan, whatever, you know, whatever you like. But you, you just get the new vehicle and you're like, you can wait a little while, God. I'm enjoying this. I got the new. And our praise begins to diminish a little bit. <laughs> And our hallelujahs get a little bit softer and we get complacent and we forget about everything that's going on around us. We forget about the price that was paid. We forget about the, the Savior who's returning. And what if the, he's coming back for a church that's expecting him, that's, that's going to be happy to see him returning. Paul said there's a crown of righteousness that's awaiting those who are eagerly anticipating his return. Yet we haven't been eagerly anticipating. We haven't been doing what we should be doing, living how we should be living. We seem to still be stuck in the world a little too much. But verse 7. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. I just want to sit right here for a minute. See, there's a, the, the bride. Do you know who the bride is? The bride of Christ is the church. That would be us. And the bride has... Whenever in a Hebrew wedding, in the Bible times, it was different than it is today. You know, here we, we, I mean, we can get married. We can throw them to the curb. It doesn't matter. You know, but to them, it began at engagement. For them to, to say, I'm going to marry someone. There was a, a, a covenant that was forged at that point before the wedding ever occurred. And the bride was promised. They, 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 more accurately, they say betrothed to her husband before ever having a wedding. And at that point, the, the groom would go away. He would go back to basically his father's house and he would build a room. He would make a place for them. And then until the, the place was finished, once, the, once everything, every screw's been turned, uh, the, the joints are all floated on the house, you know, whatever it takes, whatever they did, uh, every rock is in place and floors are swept and it, it's all ready. At that point, the father would give permission to his son to go and snatch his bride away, to go get his bride. We see the same thing being mentioned by Jesus when he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I'm going to come back and I'm going to snatch you away. And it, but I, we're, we're, we're promised to be married. The marriage, is, the wedding is coming. But he, we are already in the family. We're still just the bride, though. We're not the wife yet. We're still the bride waiting, anticipating his return. Longing for him to come. Because what would happen is, as they began to look, you know, they, they would see, you know, I'm sure that the, the family could see, the, the bride could see, you know, he's getting close. Time's getting close. He's, he's almost through with that room. It could be any day now. Now, I'll tell you, that's what we're seeing take place in the world today. We, as the family of the bride, we're seeing, hey, the house is almost ready. But if you, if you look at, at the, 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 what's going on in society today, if you look at what's happening in the Middle East, you can say, the room is almost ready. Oh, amen. The bridegroom is about to come snatch away his bride. And what would happen is the bride, as in, in anticipation of this event, she starts to do more and more, get herself ready. Uh, we, we see the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25. Where they had five foolish and five wise. The only, the only difference is the five uh, wise prepared. They were ready. They kept the oil in their lamps. They, 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 they made sure they had everything they needed for that moment. And then whenever they heard the, the, the groom's coming, the bridegroom's on his way, the five foolish ones were like, Hey, 
We're out of stuff. We need some. We, we need oil in our lamps. We, we need some of what you got. And it wasn't that they were being mean. It's that they could not give what was not theirs to somebody else. Amen. Because that oil represents the Holy Spirit in your life. And if you don't have that Holy Spirit, what are we told in, in Romans chapter 8? That the, the, the proof of salvation isn't because you prayed a prayer in an altar somewhere. It's that you have the presence of the Holy Spirit. That was the thing that was given as the deposit and the guarantee. So these five foolish run out to try and, and buy their oil. And as they're out, you see the groom come in. He snatches the five away. And the other five come back and realize they missed it. And they go and they beat on the door. Hey, let us in. He says, sorry, I don't know you. I don't know you. And they missed it. And they didn't get in. The bride has to make herself ready. The bride has to prepare herself. We spend a lot of time trying to prepare other people. You ever notice that? We're all in everybody else's business. Instead of worrying about what's really important in ours. We try to make sure everybody else. You get your ducks in a row. Let, let's look at what you got. Man. Worry about you. But do you know what they did? God does. Do you know that they they did this thing and that thing? And and how can you even let them come to this church? I've had people tell me stuff like that before. Really? You're shocked by that? That that got under your skin? Isn't Isn't the church supposed to be a place for hurting people? We didn't come here because we're perfect. If they were checking for perfect at the door, none of us would be in here. So she's preparing herself. Now, how does she prepare herself? Look at verse 8. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Man, we didn't even have to try and figure it out. God was like, they're not going to get this. Put it in parentheses. So how do we prepare ourselves for the groom? How do we prepare ourselves for the day that is rapidly approaching? Through good works. I thought we didn't have to do good works. I thought our salvation wasn't reliant upon that. It's not. You didn't have to do one thing to give your life to Jesus. But now that you have, he's expecting something. So I thought salvation was free. I told somebody this the other day. It's free, but it'll cost you everything. Isn't that what he told the young man, the rich young ruler they called him? When he said, what must I do to inherit salvation? What do I have to do to get saved? He says, go sell everything you got. And he said, whoa, I got a lot of stuff. I like my stuff. I like my stuff better than I like you. I can't do this. Who can do such a thing? But Jesus said, it's going to cost you everything. To follow him is to let go of everything in this world. And follow Him. Seek Him. Go where He's going. Do what He's doing. Prepare yourself. Through good works. Through righteous acts. What is a righteous act? What is something? If something is righteous, what does that mean? Because we can be like, that's righteous. We have no idea what we're talking about. (laughs) Righteous means it is right before God. It is what he has called us to do. I got in an argument with somebody one time that I, I said, yep. He, I kept saying, talking about doing righteous things and, and, and acting righteously and acting according to God. And they're like, you don't have to do that. You are righteous. I said, yeah, now act like it. You're holy. Yeah, because he said I'm holy. Now I have to live holy. 
My life has got to come in to alignment with His Word. So there's things that He's expecting of me. That means there's things that I can't like. There's things that He doesn't like that all the time... I mean, every all the time in my life I'm finding something... I really like this thing. And I just know God's at the background going, I don't. But God, what about this thing? Hey, hey have you ever, you ever know people that do this? They, they come to God and say, what can I get away with? <laughs> what? You're asking the wrong question. It's not how, how bad can I be? It's how good can I be? How can I show my God my love? How can I give Him everything? How, what, what, do, what, what is it going to take for me to prepare myself, to make myself ready for His return? What in your life are you doing that should not, it should not be there? What is it that, you're, that you get hung up in that's keeping you from readying yourself? from doing the good He's called you to do. From doing the righteous things instead of stupid. I'm not calling you stupid. I'm just saying what you're doing stupid. Not not just you, but the proverbial you. You understand? But we can get so distracted and lose our way. And and we think, we get get all messed up. Everything falls apart and we're like, God, how can you let this happen? Well, have you been preparing yourself? Have you been readying yourself? Because your groom is coming. And he don't want you playing around with stuff. He wants you faithful. What are you doing? Verse 9. Then the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. I want to tell you, if you know Jesus and he's given you his Holy Spirit in your life, you are invited. It's a dinner that is in your honor. Because you are the bride. This is a dinner for you. Because of you. It's a celebration on your behalf. You know, every time somebody gives their, self, gives their life over to Jesus, we're told that all of heaven rejoices when a sinner comes home. All of heaven. You know what they're doing? They're just practicing for the big day. For that big wedding banquet, that feast that's going to be held in our honor. It's for you. You may say, well, I don't deserve it. I don't either. None of us do. But He picked us. He chose us. And He's having a banquet in our honor. Verse 10, at this, John says, I fell at His feet to worship Him. But this must have been an awesome, awesome event. Hearing this message, seeing this angel, and He's like, I just got to praise something. And he falls down at this angel's feet. And look what the angel says. Don't do that. I'm a fellow servant with you. And your brothers and sisters. Who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For it is the spirit of prophecy. Who bears testimony. Of G- testimony to Jesus. Amen. Don't worship me. I'm just, I'm just like you. The angel is telling him this. It's God you need to worship. Not an angel. Not a car. Not a job. It's God. Amen. And God alone. That is worthy of your praise. It's worthy of your worship. It's worthy of your time. Because look what's about to happen. Verse 11 says, I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. Notice it's capitalized. Faithful and True. Because these are His names. They're not just who He is. 
It's not just what he is. It's not just that he is faithful. It's not just that he tells the truth a lot. He is true. He is faithful. This, it's part of his character. It's part of his identity. It says, with justice, he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire. And on his, on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is the word of God. So far, we're not told his name yet. But can you can you see who this is that's riding this horse? His name is the word of God. Well, John told us who that was back in John 1, 1. Because the word was made flesh and dwelt among men. We know who that word is and it's Jesus. Why is John beating around the bush? Why you getting, why did you say Jesus is riding on a horse? Because this sounds a lot better. <laughs> but you see Jesus come riding in, and you see his robe dipped in blood. That's not his blood that he's coming in on the bottom of his robe. You remember the wine press that was being pressed? Back a couple chapters earlier, when, and in the, this wine press, what they would do, they put all the grapes in this big barrel, big vat, and there's a hole at the bottom for all the juice to run out. They put all the grapes in there, and then people with clean feet, I hope, jump in and start stomping the grapes, smashing it down, and the juice gets all over them. Well, he said, this is the grapes of wrath. That were in this barrel. That are in this drum. And him, he's smashing them. And it's their blood that ran over it as deep as a horse's bridle. It's the blood of his enemies. So well, I thought those were people. If you're an enemy. If you choose this world. You are an enemy of Jesus Christ. And you will not win. In that fight. You know, one of the things that motivated me to give my life to Jesus was I was scared to death of hell. I did not want to go to hell because I knew that whenever I had to face Jesus one day, there was no way I was going to be able to stand in his presence. And I didn't like the other side of the fence. Amen. But you know what? That, that didn't keep me there. Because as I got to know him, I began to fall in love with him. And he changed everything for me. But that God, that Jesus, he's coming back. He's riding this horse. It, it, it's an awesome picture. Then look what happens. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Guess who that is? Us. We're coming back. We're, we're dressed in our, our Sunday best. And I, I can't wait to get my Sunday best. I don't really have a Sunday best. But we're all going to be wearing the same thing. We're going to be in these white robes, riding white horses. And we're riding back. And you know what weapons we have? None. And we're his army. And we're riding out with him. Why aren't we a little intimidated by this? Because we have him. He's the weapon. He is. We're riding back with him. Continuing on. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written. King of Kings. And Lord of Lords. King of Kings. And Lord of Lords. Amen. On his robe. And on his thigh. Now some people will tell you that's a tattoo. Okay Bob. But. I think maybe he's just wearing designer jeans. You know maybe. you know, I, I had some Nikes one time. That had Nike. You know maybe. Maybe he's just you know. He's dressed in a robe. And he's got some nice pants on underneath. And he's got his name going down. And I, I don't know. I, it's on his thigh. Maybe he's even feeling a little, you know. He's got a little thigh hanging out. And let everybody see. King of kings. 
We got all hung up on that, but what we're missing is what it's called, the name that is on him, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It's really it's it's more than what we can our, our language puts together. It's more like King Lord. Amen. King Lord. And it, 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 it there's so many people out there that, that say Jesus is my savior. <laughs> But they have no concept of Him being their Lord. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 tells us that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Savior, no, what does it say? Your Lord. Well, what does that... Is that the same thing? You can't be... He's not your Savior if He's not your Lord. He said, well, I knew him a long time as my Savior, but I never really embraced him as my Lord. (laughs) What? That don't even make sense. But I hear people say that. I'm like, that's not scriptural. You had a fondness for him at one point. Maybe you were like, yeah, I'm really glad I got fire insurance. Ooh, I'm not going to hell. Ooh, dodge that bullet. Now, what are we going to do? He's got to be your Lord in order for him to be your savior. He's got to be your king. It's like God's being redundant here. He's your king and your Lord. Figure that out. He's not your good buddy. He's not a guy that comes over occasionally. He's the guy who is in charge of your life. It's my life and I'm going to live it the way I want to live it. You can't tell me nothing. I, I'm happy doing what I'm going to do. And, and you can't stop me. No, but look at what's waiting for you. We've got to live our lives for him. Make him your king today. Make him your Lord today. Because that's the only way you get to ride in his army. It's on his chest. It's on his thigh. Who he is and what he's supposed to be to us. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And then he's coming to wage war. Get that picture out of your head. You know, I, I have it too. I have to get that thing out of my head all the time. I don't know who painted it, but they did not do justice to Jesus. This white, pasty looking guy looking up at an angle with long, flowing hair. It's kind of oily. You know the picture, right? Yep. And he's just so meek and he's holding a lamb. Petting poor lamb. I love everyone. He, you see the Jesus that's coming back? Amen. It ain't like God gave us this letter yesterday. This letter has been here for thousands of years. 1,800 years, 2,000 years, however long it's been that he wrote this about himself. He's like, I'm coming and I'm waging war. Amen. He means business. He's not some weak, mamby-pamby, feminist Jesus. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's got a name written on him that none of us even know. There's a lot that's been made about the name that none of us can know. So I, I really don't understand why people try to make a lot of that. Because, hey, guess what? We don't know. And as soon as you think, I think it's this name. Well, then guess what? You're wrong because no one knows. You can make a good educated guess, but you'll be wrong because no one knows that name that's upon him. Nobody knows his name. But we now we have a glimpse of who he is and who he's supposed to be to us. And if he's not your king and he's not your Lord, then he's not your savior. You can't have one without the other. Reminds me of that song. Love and marriage, love and marriage. But anyway, it goes hand in hand. They go together. You got to have them. Verse 17 And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair Come gather, come gather together for the great supper of God. So there's going to be another feast. One that's held because of the wedding and another that's going to be held here. This is just this is not the one you want to be at so that you may eat the flesh of kings 
generals and the mighty of horses and their riders and the flesh of all people, free and slave, great and small. I titled this chapter, chapter 19, a tale of two feasts. Because one, you're either the guest of honor or the other, you're the main course. I don't know about you, but I'd rather be the guest of honor any day than to have my flesh left for birds to eat. Because what's going to happen? You read on in the chapter there, the finish out the chapter. He, he, he comes, Jesus comes back. And the sword comes out of his... What is that symbolizing? What is the only weapon he needs? It's the same thing that he used in creating everything. The same thing... The only thing that he needs is his word coming from his mouth. That's the sword that he uses. It isn't like it's some sci-fi thing. Ah, a big old sword comes flying. No, he just speaks a word and it's done. They're all dead and they turn into bird food. Amen. And all of the birds, can't you just imagine just, all these people on this battlefield, the, the, the valley of Armageddon? You know, you know Armageddon? You, you heard of that, that one, right? This is Armageddon taking place and, and they're all gathered in this valley. It's not just a love story about an asteroid coming to Earth and it has nothing. I don't know what they came up with that name for. But anyway, the Armageddon, they're, they're, they're gathered in this valley of Megiddo. They're, they're gathered together and all of the, the armies are like, yeah, we're going to take out God's people. All of a sudden you see, ha, ha, all these birds are coming around. Huh. I wonder what they're doing. Look at all the, this is weird. Look at all the birds. I think this is a bad sign. Yes, it is a bad sign. And all of a sudden, heaven opens up and the, the, the beast and, and his prophet, they're all standing there and they're like, get ready, boys. And then they're like, what are we going to do about that? There's horses coming out of the sky with people on them. And then all of a sudden, Jesus opens his mouth. I don't know what the word is he says, but he speaks a word and it annihilates everybody. And the birds are like, lunch. <laughs> it's on. And we're told that he takes the beast and his prophet who had been deceiving people for so long. And he puts him in the fiery lake of sulfur. What was happening at the beginning of this chapter? They said the smoke from their destruction goes up forever and ever. Don't listen to those people that say, well, hell, it was a garbage dump. It really, it was a place called, the word was Gehenna. And that was like the, the place where they burned trash outside the city. So it's like, you know, we're just going to sit in the dump. You know, maybe it's just separation from God. And that's enough of a you know, bad thing. You know, we, we just won't get to see God. Well, you hadn't seen him your whole life. How's that torture? I mean, you've been doing whatever you want to do all the way up to this point anyway. Well, we'll just be very alone. And just eternity alone. No, no. Do you understand? Forever and ever is eternity. And we've seen where the, the, the beast... And his prophet have been thrown into this fire that will burn for eternity. And coming up in a few chapters, we're about to see where all those who stand opposed at the end of everything, they're all going into that lake of fire to burn for eternity. Not just till you're through burning, but forever. That torment will last forever. Say forever. forever. You don't want to go there. You don't want to be in that number. Because though those people, all of that flesh was being eaten by those birds, their judgment is still coming. There's still judgment that awaits all of those who have died in the past and will die in the future that do not know our God. That do not know Jesus Christ. So which dinner table will you be at? Will you be the guest of honor or will you be the main dish? 
Because you decide. You decide. If you've never asked Jesus to come into your life, if you've never asked Him to become your Lord and Savior, then you're going to the second one. But I'm a good person. How can you say it? God wouldn't send me to hell. I, I do good all the time. Hell is filled with people who have done good. But if you don't have Jesus as your sacrificial lamb, if you don't have Jesus as the one who's paid the price to cover your sins, that hell awaits you. Well, how do I get Jesus to become my Lord and Savior? You ask Him. You repent of your sin, which just means you stop sinning. Stop going the direction you're going and turn around and go His way. Ask Him to forgive you of the sins that you've committed. Commit your life to Him. Ask Him to be the master of your life. And He will do it. He will do it. And your life can be forever changed. And your destiny will be forever sealed. You can belong to Him today. But many of us have asked Jesus to be our Lord and Savior. But we haven't been living as He's our Lord and Savior. He's coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle. That He's washing through the water of His Word. Yet most of us look like we've been hit by a Mack truck bride. We look like we've been drugged behind a car bride. We haven't been living the life He's called us to live. We haven't been preparing ourselves, getting ourselves ready for... We, we, he's, he's coming. He's coming. Prepare yourself through acts of righteousness. He's called us to so much more. And yet we live pitiful lives. What is God calling you to? Which category do you fall into? Say, so, well, how do I prepare myself? How do I do righteous acts whenever I've got to pay the bills? How do I do righteous acts when I have to go to work every day with a bunch of heathen people? I hate everybody I work with. I want to kill them all. If I worked at a post office, I'd take a gun on purpose. If I flew a plane, I'd nosedive that thing. I'm just not happy. I'm miserable. Man, fine. Jesus. Take Him to work with you. Start showing Him to those people that don't know Him. That's your mission field. Amen. Amen. Those people you can't stand. What does Jesus say? Start blessing them. Speak life over them. Show them the way. But they act like I'm stupid. Well, maybe you are. Just do it anyway. <laughs> Newsflash. We're all a little nutty. Okay? They're going to think less of me. They already think less of you. You might as well go on and stand up for something. Live for Jesus. Make a change. Because it starts with you. And that righteous act that He's called you to do to prepare you, I promise you, it's going to start preparing others. What you're full of will splash out onto them. Just take them to work with you. Put God first in everything. Make Him your Lord and Savior today. Don't buy into that lie that, well, He's just been my Savior. And I just live my own life. It's not the way it works. King of kings and Lord of lords. He's got to be that in your life today. Amen. Can we pray together?
Jesus, we thank you today that you are coming back. That you're coming back for a bride that's waiting you. That that's longing for your appearing. And God, I pray that you help us. You empower us with your spirit today to be able to become the bride you called us to be. That we might be able to prepare ourselves to show ourselves worthy of you. That the world around us could look at our lives and see Jesus and not just us. God, empower us for those righteous acts today. Empower us with your Holy Spirit to be the church that you called us to be. So that we can be ready when you choose to return. And God, I pray for those in this place today that do not know you. God, I pray for those hearts that are here today that, that don't know you, that, that don't know you as their Lord and as their Savior. God, I pray that you can fix their heart today. That today would be their day of divine appointment with you. That they can know what it means to have life and life more abundant. God, for those of us that know you, but haven't lived for you. Those of us that have fallen dreadfully short of the righteous acts you called us to. God, we ask you to forgive us. We ask you to empower us. That we might become your bride. The bride that you long for. Right without spiraling. Forgive us where we failed you. Make us more than we could ever imagine. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, I don't care how long you've been in this church, but you've been in the church for years, but you've never made that commitment to Him. Make it today. Don't leave this place alone. Take Him with you. He wants to transform your life. He has a great future for you. But He can't bring it to you not with you. He's not in you. Surrender to him today. Give yourself to him.